So I begin again thanking respectful director and secretary, Principal Dr. N. Rajeshwari, Head of the Department Dr. D. Sujata, Organizer Mrs. K. Satipriya, all the other faculty members who are involved in bringing us together today. I'm so happy the college has arranged a program on a very current topic such as culture at crossroads, clashes and conciliation. It is the need of the hour and people should understand how important culture is and how much, what are the limitations and what are the parameters? How mad you should be after culture and how not mad you should be about culture. What is culture? That complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a man as a member of society, said Edward Tyler. Even knowledge is culture. When you walk into uh, a department where you have a lot of science related people, the culture there will be slightly different. The words they use will be different. The clothes they use may be different depending upon their elaborate needs. But when you walk into an arts department, the words they use will be different. Diction will be different. Expectations will be different. Importance and priorities may be different. So even knowledge is culture. Belief is culture. Art forms, of course, everybody knows. Morals is culture. Morality itself is a question now. As I move on into my presentation, you will understand what is morality. When you talk to students today, they say, uh, if I talk to a boy, you get angry. But what's wrong in talking to a girl, being intimate with a girl? So morality itself is a question mark. What is morality according to your definition? It becomes an individual definition. Law, custom, everything is culture. Law in India is different. Law in England is different. Any other capabilities and habits, habits make culture acquired by man as a member of society. As a member of Tamil society, what's your culture? As a member of Indian society, what's your culture? As a member of, you know, Gujarati society or Bihar society or Kannada society, Kerala society, each culture has a different definition. So what is culture altogether? It has multiple meanings. How we dress, how we eat, how we speak, what we think also is culture. When you are alone in a room or in a house and you know nobody is there to peep at you, to what extent your thoughts can go, to what extent your activities can go also is your culture. Unstated rules, it can also be called embedded norms, become culture. Rules that regulate everyday practices and activities become culture. Embedded norms, I told you, in society, for example, in a house, uh, there is a particular place where grandpa often sits and at a particular time he comes and sits in the same chair. So at that time, people around are very careful not to sit in the chair and make him ask you, get up, I want the chair. That is, you don't want your grandpa to tell you, get up, I want the chair. It's an embedded norm. Oh, that's grandpa's chair. And at around five o'clock in the evening, he comes down and sits in that chair. That's called an embedded norm. Uh, and similarly, in our culture, Asian culture, is not international culture. I can boldly speak about uh, Asian culture, where we have respect for uh, a, a person, even if he or she is a year elder to us or uh, a two, two, three years elder to us. I would like to give you the example of BTS. I, I hope all of you know the K-pop uh, uh, team that is becoming very famous. So in even uh, as they speak about this uh, uh, K-pop team, they show you as the seniors and the uh, uh, younger group. And all these younger ones such as Jimin and... Yes, sir. And sir. Younger, uh, talk to the elders by using the word yeah. in their language, Hume. So Asia has this culture of Res having a word that expresses respect when somebody is a few years elder to you. Now that's culture and you know how to treat them, you know their limits and you want to make sure they're comfortable even when you speak to them. That is why you have words. Words make a lot of meaning. Culture is a way of life, a product 
of humans living together ah monday na inga monday tuesday ok ro ok rose elta malle amata avaru cheppandi and you have the culture of wearing flowers all adhe konju ottanaram theriyadu alakoda i think there is a disturbance adhe adhe is there a disturbance can you hear multiple voices yes yes ma'am yes ma'am shanti shri ma'am please mute your mic please yes ma'am now it's okay ma'am okay sorry for the disruption no that doesn't matter that doesn't matter culture a way of life a product of humans living together now you live together every evening your culture has this habit of adorning your hair with flowers everybody does it so that is the culture in that society but when you come out of this culture you don't do it anymore maybe flowers are not available or they are too costly so when you are in a society and people follow a particular custom you naturally fall into that culture includes all the characteristic activities interests of people you have activities coming every friday or every wednesday something happens or every evening friday evening you have prayers that's an activity interests of people what all your interest in like in tamil nadu you won your jallikattu culture back uh, it was actually uh, banned because of loss of life but then uh, the culture and the importance and the masculinity involved in the game was very important for uh, the domicile or the people who are born and who have lot of respect for that culture but it doesn't happen in any other state almost like a bull fight social interactions and relationships become culture how you socially interact with people now in india we have this tradition we don't do it every time but during the times of exams we make our children fall at the feet of our parents that is children fall at the feet of the grandparents before going for their exam so that is how they interact with each other that is how they maintain the relationship they are elder to you they are your grandparents this is how you show respect it is a culture when you go towards eastern countries if you browse through uh, the um, uh, paraphernalia or the protocol of respecting uh, people in for example thailand or malaysia singapore uh, indonesia you, uh, it, the more you go and you see their culture you will understand how they have social interaction and this is different in different societies different communities now the world is becoming multicultural you have culture in different theories and they have theorized culture so sur in structuralism and semiotics brings it in bats myths of bourgeois societies and texts foucault in history and philosophy he brings this marx underlines modes of production even kristeva in feminism touches upon culture cultural resistance now there are different different types different topics most of you must have uh, read these on the newspapers every day especially in uh, sunday supplements there are a lot of uh, uh, you know topics discussed nowadays literature is being you know uh, uh, discussed different theories of literature even are being discussed in the newspaper earlier we literature people used to go take books learn and inform the public but now everything is available available on the net so what are the different types of cultures or cultural theories when you talk about cultural studies it starts with cultural resistance cultural resistance is the practice of using meanings and symbols that is culture to contest and combat a dominant power often constructing a different vision of the world in the process so there is a particular culture and you don't like it and you want to resist this culture The modern theory of cultural resistance was first articulated in the mid 19th century by Matthew Arnold in his essay Culture and Anarchy. This is almost like the textbook of cultural studies. But after that, towards the end of my presentation, I shall suggest various textbooks you could refer to if you are doing research in cultural studies or you like to read on cultural studies. So, what happens under cultural resistance? Culture are also contested terrains i use r here because i talk about different types contested you can contest like politics you need different types of parties you 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 are biased toward towards a party and you want that party to win but the others should also exist only then there will be variety and one will be afraid of the other and performance will be better 
So there will be contested terrains and what are they? The dominant ideology is not reproduced. They don't like the dominant ideology. So cultural resistance happens. Foucault believes power always brings forth opposition and resistance. If somebody comes to power and says you have to dress only like this. That is what happens between our generation and our students' generation. We say you should not wear jeans in college. That is not an official dress. And when they feel that is OK, only you have this contested terrain happening. They feel what is there in dress. But we know that if it is a college, if it is a university, there should be discipline. Power seeks to contain and control such resistances. So authority contains this resistance. It incorporates hegemony. Now forget about college and dress code. When you come to society, now people control other people. Resistance is counter power. So there is another power that side which resists this power that is dominating the society. Response to power's expression. It is also a response. Cultural resistance is a response to power that dominates. Power that is hegemonic. This is one example. Cultural clashes. The topic is clashes and conciliations. There uh, always has been strict rules laid down by society. More than society religion. Our religious textbook says men should dress only this way. Women should dress only this way. Most of our religious textbooks have dress code for men and women. So now the world though in, in uh, countries like India and South Asian countries. We always have clashes based on religion. It is not that very evident in the northern parts. You have these people, you know, spreading it out to the other countries, but otherwise there are many non-religious people also. Now that doesn't mean you can do anything you like, but this is just one example of what is called cultural clash. There are people who do not accept authority that tells them you have to dress only this way. So when religion, society, philosophy interferes in their life and says this is your dress code. There is cultural resistance. Youth culture springs up and they say it's my body, my hair. I would like to keep it the way I like. So protest is exaggerated and it lands in the form of the picture you see in front of your eyes. I have used both on the right. You have men also and on the left you have a lady too because in certain countries coloring your hair, cutting your hair as you like and tattooing is against their uh, societal principles against their religious textbooks too. So these set of people who are perhaps non believers want to protest and this is how they show cultural resistance. Forms of resistance, micro political gestures of contempt, just like alienation in the classroom. So you can see gangs in the classroom. One gang's culture, the other one wouldn't accept. So naturally there'll be a political divide. That is how they start resisting. Full scale social and political revolutions. For example, suffrage. Men enjoying the right to vote and women not giving being given the right to vote ended up in suffrage. So there are political movements in the form of cultural resistance involves transgression. Transgression nobody listens to you. So you protest like Satyagraha. In India for the sake of freedom fighting. So you protest you. You have a non cooperation so that you show your resistance. Exceed acceptable boundaries set by established customs. That is called punk culture. You exceed, you cross the boundary and do what you like to show. You don't like what you're telling me. Long ago, now it wouldn't happen because I think students have understood or they slightly have accepted because of competition and the population growing. They somehow have to get into colleges and they need a seat. So they naturally accept the policies of the college. But 20 years ago when I had just become a teacher, I became a teacher in 2000. I realized that when the university put a rule that students should be dressed modestly in college, 
there was a guy who often used to turn up only in red blood red jeans every day so he used to argue that it's red in color it's not jeans it's red in color jeans is blue in color and every day the principal had a headache had to send him back but he would deliberately come the next day in the same color to cut class and walk off his way of cultural resistance he feels my brain is more important than what i wear but then we have to fall into policies and what happens is all these people who resist culture soon fall in line sometimes especially youth culture for the sake of jobs whatever they resist during college life or teenage they naturally uh, give up and then change the color of their hair cut it properly and then go for a job interview because they need the job very badly but there is youth culture that expresses cultural resistance this is one example of how culture differs the lgbt celebrating in new delhi after they got the rights after the supreme court accepted their rights that is cultural resistance now moving on to culture and gender that is the next uh, uh, another area discussions about relationships between men and women the inequality in society natural hierarchy leads to natural inequality female associated with nature and male with culture female with the private and male with the public argument is similar to clan or caste issues so this cultural divide almost always there is a situation where you have to fight inequality and that is based on culture the inequality in society mainly comes because of culture natural hierarchy also the eldest brother gets first responsibility the second brother gets lesser respect than the first brother it goes on like that and females are always associated with nature they have to be caring they have to be nurturing they have to be loving they have to be simple they have to be very kind but male with culture the man decides uh, what dress the woman would wear the man decides what kind of job she can go to sometimes even financial maintenance is done by the man so culture and gender often exists in english literature in many textbooks change is a phenomenon that is also yes am i not audible ma'am uh, the slide is not visible ma'am okay okay now it is visible is it visible cultures women anthropologists believe that much of the writings of non western societies is formulated in terms of western assumptions that is why we have transnational feminism it was born think of kannagi many of you i think there are more than 400 participants today i do not know how many of you have logged in i would like to tell you a small incident that happened in tamil nadu many 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 years ago it is suppose it is a real story and it has been uh, scripted in their textbook called silapadikaram uh, since the organizers are uh, you know from tamil nadu they would surely know the story of kannagi many of you also must have heard of this story it is about a, a, a lady whose husband goes away from her to another lady and falls in love with the other lady and starts living with her but the other lady madhavi's mother is very careful <coughs> in squeezing all his wealth out of him and making use of it once he is dry he is thrown out though madhavi still loved him he was forced to go away and he comes back to kannagi imagine what a modern lady would do if this happens to her but kannagi being patient if you know how she behaved you wouldn't call her uh, 
and a, a person who was in another century. She accepted, forgave him, and both of them gave him a lot of hope. And they traveled to Madurai to start a new life. But when they go there, they have only very little with them. And she gives him one of her anklets to be sold so that he can get money to start a business. But the queen of that land loses one of her anklets and Carnegie's anklet looks just like the queen's. And when he goes to sell it, he's arrested. He's taken to the court of the king. And even without trial, the king orders him to be beheaded. Carnegie, who was waiting for him, gets news that her husband was arrested and also beheaded. Now, what would a modern lady do? Not people like you and me, a normal woman. She would roll on the ground, she would cry, she would call the media and she would uh, talk about the injustice that happened to her. But what Carnegie did was in those days, she took the other anklet with her and full of fury, walks into the court of the king and questions him. How many of us have the guts to walk into the chief minister's room and question him? We are very afraid that we'll be killed in spite of being modern, educated people. She just walks into the court with the other anklet and asks the queen, you lost your anklet, didn't you? What did you have inside your anklet? She says pearls. Carnegie says, I had rubies inside my anklet. I throws it on the ground. The anklet breaks. She asked them to check out what was inside the anklet they caught, got from Kovalan. That was her husband's name. And when they broke it, it also had rubies. And she won the case. But then she was angry. She wouldn't get her husband back. She accused the king of wrong trial. And her fury sets the city in fire. That is how the myth goes. But then... In our country, we have the stigma of widowhood. When she walks out, nobody was ready to accept her. And she walks westward towards Kerala. And one of the women, washerwoman, accepted her and made her sit inside her hut. And in the morning, she disappears. And that is why a temple called Kodungallur Temple is dedicated to her in the place where she disappeared. And uh, people of all castes have equal importance there because it was... A woman who gave her refuge. Now, this story is one good example of transnational feminism. Who would understand the plight of Carnegie? Indians would understand. Tamil ethnic people would understand better when I talk about stigma of widowhood. An Indian woman would understand what is the stigma of widowhood. Even today, 21st century, we have so we see so many women walking in white white clothes because afraid of the society making fun of them if they choose colors of course educated women have slowly changed but when you go into the villages you still see women walking without ornaments walking without any decoration walking without colors pure white from top to bottom so uh, when i say think of Carnegie, i'm talking about a situation that can that's so different from the western world that is why transnational feminism popped in talking about third world countries the culture in third world countries, the problems faced by these women is so different from the Western feminists. The Western feminists may not understand the individual problems faced by these women. The conventional roles, a male dominated social system based on convention, based on nature of persons. It depends upon what convention is in your family or your society. The idea of duality and dichotomy two cultures coming together women are what men are not men decide what men are then women are doubly excluded uh, some of these ideas are from Freud's women are what men are not I think you would understand uh, uh, they always feel uh, womanhood is sub to manliness so such conventional roles are discussed in culture and gender I'm not going deep into it. If there was a seminar only on culture and gender, I could have gone deeper into it. I'm just showing you the different areas in uh, culture and crossroads, what all come into culture. Cultural pluralism. Cultural pluralism is a form of cultural diversity in certain countries where cultures can still maintain their unique qualities and combine to form a larger, richer whole. In many countries, including the United States, the term multiculturalism is used synonymously or in place of cultural pluralism. So you can call it multicultural pluralism. Sometimes multiculturalism is also used, but they don't mean the same. 
I'm going to discuss it very soon. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Oh, thank you. Yep. Participants, kindly mute your audio. The notion of cultural pluralism in the United States has its roots in the transcendentalist movement and was developed by pragmatist philosophers such as Horace Callan, William James, and John Dewey. Randolph Bourne, a later theorist, provided one of the most famous articulations of cultural pluralism through his 1916 essay, Transnational America. Callan is widely credited as being the originator of the concept of cultural pluralism, Horace Callan, that is. His 1915 essay in The Nation, titled Democracy versus the Melting Pot, was written as an argument against the concept of the Americanization of the European Union. He coined the term cultural pluralism itself in 1924 through his culture and democracy in the United States. So he was trying to talk about the definition of cultural pluralism. A condition in which minority groups participate fully in the dominant society yet maintain their cultural differences. So it is like um, Diwali being celebrated in the White House and uh, the European or uh, the English Prime Minister wishing on Diwali on Pongal. That is because uh, Indians are permitted to enjoy their culture with all rights. A doctrine that a society benefits from such a condition, the society will certainly benefit when there is cultural pluralism. One example is America, where all cultures are accepted. What is the aspect of culture? Under what conditions may an ethnic group be considered to be a cultural group? What kind of society do we want? So what is the kind of cultural group you call cultural? Now, in today's world, what is culture itself is a question mark, isn't it? If, a, if one of our daughters walks into the house with another girl and tells us she's interested in marrying that girl, that is her way of looking at morality. Legally, you and I have no right to stop her, but we will have our own culture. That depends on what culture we come from, the society we come from. So what kind of society do we want? On what basis do we want to meet each other as we live our lives? How do you want to look at each other? What role do we want our schools to assume within our idealized conception of society? What kind of culture do you want our schools to teach our children? We have so many uh, you know, syllabuses. We have state, we have CBSE, we have ICSES, and you have so many other kinds of syllabus, syllabi. Uh, uh, you have uh, international schools in our country. So how should groups and individuals be identified and treated in schools? What should our children be taught? Now there's a big argument about what all the textbooks should have, what are the lessons our children should be taught. Of course, there should be a lot of material that makes them accept different types of cultures. E pluribus unum from many one that is the meaning of this that is what is stamped on the american currency it means that it acknowledges that it is a pluralistic society not so much a melting pot but a stew it's not just a melting pot it's almost a stew a society in which minority groups maintain their independent cultural traditions and where no one minority imposes its views on the other the minority groups can have their own traditions and one minority cannot dominate another minority. Pluralism is not multiculturalism. The key difference between pluralism and multiculturalism is this. Pluralism is based on exceptional values as determined by the host society. Multiculturalism is based on lowest common denominator values. Multiculturalism idealizes objective reality, but cultural pluralism advocates the tolerance of subjective reality. That's the difference. Multiculturalism has an objective reality. That is, you have a common rule. You can go home and enjoy your culture, but when you come out, you should follow the common rule. 
but when it comes to cultural pluralism it has tolerance you can wear what you want you can to, uh, to the extent you have uh, to the maximum you have freedom and there is tolerance of subjective reality multiculturalism many people think multiculturalism just means showing respect and tolerance to other cultures and faiths if that way so it should be unarguable we should all support respect and tolerance it is not just in a multicultural society even if you are a human being anywhere you have to respect another human being but that is not what multiculturalism is at all it holds that all minority values must have equal status to those of the majority any attempt to uphold majority values or minority is a form of prejudice that turns minorities into a cultural battering ram to destroy the very idea of being a majority culture at all so multiculturalism should see that majority values do not dominate the values of the minority the end result of multiculturalism is that balkanization of a society pluralism on the other hand does not pluralism is based on a value system that we all hold in common multiculturalism is based on the lowest common denominator of values in a society that's how that works but pluralism is never like that it accepts all multiculturalism tolerates pluralism accepts that's the difference pluralism allows for many different groupings unlike multiculturalism does not try to impose one uniform status on all of them that is you can sing your song inside your room but when you come out there's a common song it allows a thousand flowers to bloom with minorities forming communities of faith ethnicity or culture within a society but under the overarching umbrella of a national identity to whose core values everyone signs up there's a national identity and everyone signs up to that core values but then you can be yourself it is only by having that overarching set of common values monogamy freedom of conscience equal rights for women freedom of expression that a society coheres as a common project whatever is common will come un- under only this freedom of conscience equal rights for women freedom of expression nothing of the other uh, values that you have will be disturbed pluralist culture in a pluralist culture groups not only coexist side by side but also consider qualities of other groups as traits worth having in the dominant culture pluralistic societies place strong expectations of integration on members rather than expectations of assimilation they don't assimilate they integrate the existence of such institutions and practices is possible if the cultural communities are accepted by the larger society in a pluralistic culture and sometimes require the protection of the law sometimes they need to be protected by law often the acceptance of a culture may require that the new or minority culture remove some aspects of their culture which is incompatible with the laws or values of the dominant culture now sometimes you have to uh, be ready to slightly adjust you can follow your culture but for the common good of others there may be uh, rules and regulations which uh, try to remove some aspects of your culture which are in ca- Uh, compatible with the law cultural identity the struggle of recognition of the collective rights inherent in the cultural identity of different peoples struggle of rec- recognition of the collective rights that is together you have a right and how you struggle to keep it for your people like the way tamil nadu one jelly cut rights different peoples ethnic groups regions communities and classes has been the main objective of this growing trend so the reason is because you have different ethnic groups significant progress has been shown in terms of satisfying the increasingly complex demands of these groups there's a lot of progress and people are trying to satisfy the needs of these groups every time these demands aim to assert the existence of diverse cultures that organize themselves as societal actors with progressive participation in both the national and international scene so there are demands mainly to assert the existence of these different cultural groups and as um, the governments change as uh, colleges spread education there is more awareness 
about this culturally divided system and how we have to uh, help them remain happy with their own cultural identity. Original culture. Current societal processes have revitalized local and regional cultures and empowered indigenous peoples and they have allowed them to create particular cultural systems. These dynamics find answers in the original culture of the peoples, giving rise to new identities that in turn enrich diversity. Suppose we say this is my culture. Now most of us must have migrated from somewhere. But the people who live in the mountainous regions are actually the original people of each of our terrain. Let it be Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Bihar, Gujarat, Nagaland, Mizoram, Kashmir. The people who lived there, the original people will have their original culture. So how to help them? How to help the indigenous people get empowered? And how to bring out their culture and take good things and then help them retain their identity with respect is called an enriched culture. No assimilation into larger culture. The term cultural pluralism has evolved in modern times through Callan's essay, I had mentioned him in the beginning, Democracy versus the Melting Pot in 1915. In the nation, this book itself was written 100, 105 years ago. In the nation in which he presented an argument against the Americanization of European Im immigrants. We ourselves have suffered this in the 21st century. Many of our cousins who have gone abroad, especially to America, have got Americanized. They don't even understand uh, the culture of their own grandparents who have lived here with discipline, with good values. It is the sociological term which advocates that different ethnic groups must be allowed to foster in society without being forced to assimilate their identity with the relatively larger ethnic groups. Now, if I go to America, and I want to work in a particular office. I want to wear a bindi. I should have enough importance. I should be given enough importance to allow me to do what I like. But generally it is not so. None of them wear it. And that's not a big issue. Just giving you one small example. You can wear it or leave it. It's up to your need and up to your culture. It's just a small example of assimilation. Their identity with relatively larger ethnic groups. Such an approach is opposite to multiculturalism, which implies forced cultural amalgamation to achieve the goal of utopian social integration. You talk about a utopian world where everything is good, everything is fine, and you force small ethnic groups to assimilate into the common culture. That is called multiculturalism, but cultural pluralism will never uh, force you to do that. Just one example, now since it's literature, we spoke about cultural resistance, cultural class clashes, culture and gender, cultural pluralism. Just to see how it is applied to a textbook. Since it's culture, I've taken two textbooks. One is Amish Tripathi's Shiva Trilogy. Another one is Angels and Demons. So that uh, there is no bias towards any one particular culture. People, I don't want pe people imagining things. Amish Tripathi's Shiva trilogy fictionalizes the prehistoric world of the Saraswati civilization or Indus Valley civilization. They deal with cultural clash originating through rigidity and denial of the truth. The cultural subjectivity and objectivity, cultural pluralism and multiculturalism as presented in Shiva trilogy is also related to our present society. Shiva is a, a tribal man and he comes from the mountains to the plains to give his people the leader of a tribe. He's just shown as a leader of a tribe and then comes towards the plains to give his people a better kind of life. There is your truth and there is my truth. As for the universal truth, it does not exist, says Amish Tripathi through the character Anandamai in his Shiva trilogy, volume three, The Oath of Vayuputra. In the given statement, your truth and my truth is subjective reality, while universal truth is objective reality. So you, you see both subjective is exists, objective also exists. I don't believe in symbolic gods. I believe that God exists all around us. All around us. In the flow of the river, in the rustle of the trees, in the whisper of the winds, he speaks to us all the time. All we need to do is listen. 
He writes this in the Immortals of Meloha. Amish Tripathi has fictionalized the societies with diverse cultural beliefs. The societies of Shiva trilogy include the idealized world of Meloha of Suryavamshi, Jatchandravamshi, Naga, Vayuputra, etc. All have their individual cultural belief, code of conduct, priority, uh, propriety, and values which they eulogize while looking down upon others. One, the book clearly shows how in the beginning, later they realize all of them have important values and they have to uh, interrelate with each other for a successful society. But in the beginning, there are wars. One community looks down upon the other. The Surya Vamshi thinks the Chandra Vamshis are not very good. Amish has compared and contrasted these cultural beliefs, codes of conduct, values and ways of life to establish the fact that there is no absolute right or wrong in cultural context. There is nothing called absolutely right or absolutely wrong. The theme of the search of evil. Shiva trilogy that includes the immortals of Meloha which came in 2010, the secret of the Nagas 2011 and the oath of Vaiputras 2013 centers around the theme of the search of evil. The search of evil is carried out through the fictionalized mythic character Shiva, a prototype of Lord Shiva. In the novel, it is the mission of Shiva to find out evil in the society and to eradicate it. This mission of eradicating the evil is akin to the role of the destroyer attributed to Lord Shiva in Hindu mythology. Search for evil and destroy it. That is what the job of this tribal leader is in the novel. Culture, a way of life. This search leads to the adventurous story of the novel from one society to another, thus from one culture to another. It establishes the fact that people are not evil, but their way may be evil, influenced and regulated through, through their culture. Throughout his fiction, Amish has first compared and contrasted manners, general customs and beliefs of the people of different cultural groups and has tried to establish the fact that none is completely wrong. The motto of the Surya Vamshis, Satya, Dharma, Man, Truth, Duty, Honor, has been contrasted with the motto of Chandra Vamshis, that is Shringar, Saundarya, Swatantrata, Passion, Beauty, Freedom. This cult group has one motto, the other group has another motto. The first group thinks the other one is not good enough. And at last, Tripathi is trying to tell you, customs of all groups have something good. The Surya Vamshis believe it is well planned, people are well fed, taken care of. Still, it has its own flaws like law obsessed people that prefer laws to human sentiments, lack of personal freedom and individuality. The motto of the Surya Vamshi community can be parallel with certain ethnic groups in our contemporary society. Those who want to bring and drag people under same behavioral and philosophic configurations, thus killing their identity. There are so many ethnic groups which say only their God is good or only their lifestyle is good. The others are all uh, evil things. So that does not happen under cultural pluralism. Existentialism is humanism. In the lecture entitled Existential, Existentialism and Humanism, given by Jean-Paul Sartre, the leading philosopher of 20th century. The notable idea of the existence precedes essence has been presented. The emotional, physical, psychological and philosophical needs of each individual cannot be expected to be the same. And if it is so, compelling everyone to follow the same rule and expecting all to act equally is killing individuality. It is dangerous for a society. So each one of us has our own feelings, our emotions. Haven't you seen people in your uh, office screaming, but you feel very cool and quiet. Some people will be laughing at a joke. You feel you don't, there is no joke in it. Sometimes you keep laughing for something and they find it silly. So each of us has our own emotions, our own physical abilities. All of us cannot sing like uh, pop singers, can we? But we look uh, up at them with awe. So each of us has our limitations and our abilities. Chandra Vamshis. This existentialist philosophy is found in the motto of the Chandravamshis who value personal freedom before everything. In his search for evil, Shiva also begins to nurture the delusion that the way of the life of Chandravamshis is evil as it is completely unorganized. For example, the roads are full of potholes, open grounds have been converted into giant slums where illegal immigrants have pitched their tents on common land. Even the narrowest roads are cock-a-block with the cloth tents of the homeless. 
chock a block i'm sorry there is class conflict between the rich home owning class and the poor landless who live in the slums people are poor yet are happy as they have their freedom to live with dignity and individuality the chandravamshis the novel proposes that self consciousness is not bound to a particular culture or condition of life it is independent entity unaffected by external circumstances you have your self consciousness what kind of a person you want to be the picture of the chandravamshi community is similar to a number of places states countries around the world where the government is a failure and ineffective yet the people have their individual dignity meluhens and swadhi uh, swadvipans the natural behavioral pattern of both the cultures has also been presented through contrast the sobriety of meluhens has been contrasted against the vibrancy of swadvipans swadvip means the land of freedom it is a living embodiment of vibrant life the swadipan women's skimpy clothes and their confidence for sexuality are in sharp contrast with meluhan women who do not show any personal emotion in public even the men of swadip are fashion conscious while for meluhans moderate and restrained life is an ideal swadipans put value on freedom and passion the world of swadipans is filled with extreme love coexisting with extreme hate expressed through extreme loudness and extreme passion it is something that is completely opposite to the ideal of the melohans like you and me we are very emotional very sensitive very passionate contemporary society the cultures of melohans and swadipans can be compared with the cultures of our contemporary society there are cultures that put so much value on restraint and moderation and believe that vibrant life will lead them to evil amish must be trying to annul such belief in the fictional work people of both the cultures live in their own subjective realities and believe it to be the objective reality they are in discord as long as they look down upon one another and harmony and peace descends on both the cultures when they accept cultural pluralism the condition of our contemporary society is similar towards the goal of cultural pluralism people have reached the point of only tolerance something which is not enough now you no more speak about cultural tolerance my people we are talking about cultural acceptance don't use the word religious tolerance you cannot use it you can only use religious acceptance every path is true christopher isherwood in his book what religion is in the words of swami vivekananda writes about what swami ji said about tolerance and acceptance tolerance means that one thinks that the other is wrong yet one allows the other to exist out of sympathy such a belief is bound to create strife there will be hatred which is existing in india now and many other countries he says that only when we accept that every path is true society would be at peace as happens in the case of suryavamshi and the chandravamshi parvateshwar the general and the representative of meluhans ultimately understands and accepts the chandravamshi ideal of life along with his own suryavamshi culture his grandfather had taken the vow that the men of their family would always follow celibacy he did it while protesting against a law that allows the royals to know who their blood child is and gives them the right to adopt them while the identity of the children of common people is kept a secret if you have in red shiva trilogy you must understand that there was a a, a custom in suryavamshi people that as soon as the baby is born all babies are taken away even the mother and father do not know who their baby is or which is their baby and at last they they bring one baby the babies are all mixed up and they bring one baby to them and give it to them and that will be considered their baby they have to bring it up this was a common culture among surya vamshis so that you respect all people you don't believe in caste system but then the royal people alone were permitted to identify their baby their baby and get it back to them so that was partiality there so the uh, general's family grandfather decided they never marry why to have uh, such a weird rule if there is equality everybody should be given the same rights and slowly parvateshwar is able to fight against all kinds of inequality multiculturalism slips in the cultures of the nagas vaiputas brangas have equally been vindicated by establishing the fact that everyone's behavior is swayed by circumstances and temporal compulsions the cultural assimilation of the gunas the tribe of shiva when they reach meluha has been presented as a growth a cultural expansion they are brought into a completely new system of the meluhans 
cultural life and are expected to welcome and cherish it as it is superior to their mountain culture. They find culture here in Meluhoha better, so they accept it. Even at the immigration camp, there is a good drainage system, developed cotton clothes, taps for water, bath shop, soft bed sheets. Gunas have their own culture, which must be equally valuable for them. But they are a small tribe in contrast to the large civilization of Meluha. And so they are expected to assimilate in order to bring social integration and conformity. The Nagas are there. They also I have to move a little bit faster because I'm crossing time. They have their own culture, cultural pluralism. As long as people live in their confined subjective reality, they do not accept the existence of the Nagas. But as soon as they become ready to expand the boundary of their perception, reality dawns on them and they accept it, cultural pluralism. The acceptance of deformed Kali and Ganesha as sister and son by Shiva and Sataya can be taken as an example of the acceptance of cultural pluralism. These are characters in the novel. Please don't connect them to the deities in Hinduism. If the entire society was conscious of its duties, nobody would need to fight for their individual rights since everybody's rights would be automatically taken care of through someone else's duties. If everybody does our duty, then nobody will lose their rights. That's the meaning. Examples of youth subculture. I, I'm coming back to cultural studies. How there is always protest, expression of beliefs and attitude counter to adult world, Deeper than adoption of particular clothes styling, deeper than adoption of musical taste, resolutions represented are imagery. They are like resistance. So in Shiva trilogy, there was resistance between Surya Vamshis, Chandra Vamshis, Nagas. But soon they learn to accept things. They learn to see that unity only will bring in happiness. Now moving on to cultural materialism. It's a theory in which views culture as a productive process focusing on art such as literature. Within this culture, art is translated as a social use of material means of production after resistance, after pluralism, moving to materialism. The term was coined by Raymond Williams, who used it to describe a theoretical blending of leftist culturalism and Marxist analysis. Materialists deal with specific historical documents and attempt to analyze and recreate the zeitgeist of a particular moment in history. So it is a way of accepting culture based on historical background. Cultural materialists seek to draw attention to the processes being employed by contemporary power structures such as the church, state or the academy to disseminate ideology. To do this, they explore a text historical context and its political implications and then through close textual analysis note the dominant hegemonic position. They identify possibilities for the rejection or subversion of that position. They find out how they can counter this. British critic Graham Holderness defines cultural materialism as a politicized form of historiography, trying to find out how culture materializes, especially under the domination of uh, powerful structures. Voice for the marginalized. Traditional humanist readings often eschewed consideration of the oppressed and marginalized in textual readings. Cultural materialists routinely consider such groups in their engagement with literary texts, thus opening new avenues of approach to issues of representation. So they find out what, how culture materializes under domination of law, philosophy, religion, and then give a voice to the subaltern. Cultural clash. Now moving on. Again, Dan Brown in Angels and Demons is a good example of cultural conflict. Brown relies on the pervasive view of the eternal conflict between science and religion. Harvard professor Robert Langdon is summoned by Maximilian Kohler, the head of CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, to help solve the murder of a prominent physicist. The murder appears to be the work of the Brotherhood of the Illuminati, a secret society seeking revenge on the Catholic Church for their treatment of scientists such as Galileo. At the same time, a bomb of terrifying power ticks away in Vatican, where the College of Cardinals has assembled to elect a new Pope. Why Galileo? Because according to religion, religion says God created the world but in seven days. But that is not what science says. So how to, uh, which side will you join? So where does cultural clash come and how do you have conciliations? Teaming up with a beautiful Italian scientist, Vittoria Vetra, Langdon races against the clock to decipher 
a trial, a trail of ancient symbols to save the Vatican before it's too late. That's where analogical intelligence plays. Everywhere you have symbols and based on the symbols, he's, a, he's trying to save the uh, clergy. Uh, clash. We live in a society that is so shaped by scientific achievements that we take it for granted that science provides an authentic way of looking at life. Science is viewed as objective and rational while religion is considered mere superstition. These two realms are seen so differently. It is not hard to imagine that they have endured an eternal conflict. They have always been fighting with each other. However, this is not the case. At the time of Galileo, whose trial before the Inquisition is often taken as a paradigmatic example of the conflict, theology and the study of the natural world were closely connected. Clash again. Conflict is the most pervasive metaphor for describing the relationship between science and religion. Many would believe that the Darwinian biologist Thomas Huxley wrote in the 19th century. History records that whenever science and religious orthodoxy have been fairly opposed, the latter has been forced to retire from the list, bleeding and crushed, if not annihilated, scorched, if not slain. Science always wins in arguments. Angels and Demons by Dan Brown. It basically relates to the church as angels and inhumanity as demons. The church is considered the angels part of the title because of Christianity and the Illuminati are the demons part of the title because of the fact that they were anti-Christians. It is a perfect title for the book because it is the shortest way to describe the conflict between the church and the Illuminati. Conciliation. Now, the picture on the right side are the symbols created by the Illuminati. They tried to kill the people. Look at the picture closely. The first one is angels and demons. On the left, you have earth. It's written earth. If you read it from the top also, it will look as earth. If you read it from the bottom also, it will look as earth. That is how they have created the symbol. The next one is air. On the right side, you see fire and down water. These four natural elements are used to kill the uh, priests. And look at the center. That is their symbol. All the four elements are written together. I think you earth will be easily visible for you. First line of the diamond. Second line you have air and fire. And the last line you have water. Whenever they kill a person, the emblem is fixed on the body. So you know uh, earth has been used to kill the first person. Air has been used to kill the next person. Like that. Cultural acceptance, the need of the hour. Not tolerance. The novel itself shows the way. The Vatican announces Mick Kenna has died from injuries from his parachute landing and Bhagya is elected as Pope Luke the first. Cardinal Strauss, the Pope's new Kamalango, gives Langdon the diagramma veritatis as thanks for his help and allows him to complete his scholarly work on Galileo. The new Pope gives Langdon and Vittoria a thankful nod before stepping out on the balcony to greet the crowd below. Change is a phenomenon. Culture must be experienced differently. Culture must be organized differently. We must accept both. Now, in the previous slide, we were talking about how the Pope, in the end, the novel ends as if religion is saved from the Illuminati. The problem or the clash that has been discussed here is the conflict between religion and science. And the conciliation is acceptance. You have to accept believers and non-believers. All of us have to exist on this earth. So if you are very sincere about a particular form of God, let it be any form. Let it be a human. Let it be in the form of a dolphin. Let it be in the form of a fish. Whichever you feel is your subjective reality, as we discussed in Shiva trilogy. That is your way of gaining peace. Now, sometimes you're alone in a place. You're living alone in a house. And uh, you have acres of land around you. You're very scared. And your belief can give you strength. If that belief gives you strength, let it give you strength. So allow people to be religious if they want to. Now, if you don't believe in God, you are able to live alone in a house, dark, surrounded in a jungle and you are not afraid of anything. Your individuality is your strength. If you don't want to believe, you don't believe. But both should allow both to exist peacefully. You have to accept both. When you don't accept both and when one tries to kill the other only, there is conflict. So conciliation is acceptance. Change is a phenomenon. Ban on when uh, two years ago, you must have noticed there was conflict between two sets of people. One set saying 
ban on women of menstruating age to a particular place and another said be, uh, uh, wanting uh, to break that now we have to allow both to exist with their freedom one should not interfere you can have your beliefs but one should not interfere into the other and hurt each other's feelings you can see the pictures one side you have women who are ready to wait and accept that culture on the other side there are women who say they are happy to bleed but both should allow both to exist with freedom not hurting each other action speaks passivity kills it is not possible to claim to have pluralistic attitudes and be passive because passivity perpetuates social uh, you know instincts or uh, perpetuate social instincts or uh, it um, how sh how should i say uh, tries to allow certain evil things to cut you you can speak but you can't shout words are more powerful it is better to have a loud word rather than a loud voice because it is important to be heard but it is more important to be practical and uh, give a voice rather than shout and make things happen one good example is it is rain that helps in flowering not thunder so that is how we have to take cultural pluralism an example of pluralism is a society where people with different cultural backgrounds keep their own tradition an example of pluralism is where labor unions and employers share in meeting the needs of employees in cultures and societies such as the us there are some pockets of people that look to remain separate from the broader us culture among these are mennonites amish orthodox jews and others while they must live with the laws and many of the social norms of the broader society by isolation they are able to retain much if not most of their cultural identity they generally do not marry out of their cultural group they do not interact with the broader society unless absolutely necessary and they keep their own views and beliefs to themselves the role of this is to retain their culture and remain as pure to their cultural morals and ethical standards as possible so this exists in america too example of no cultural pluralism for example in saudi arabia while a lot of migrants bring their culture along and the country now has a considerable south asian diaspora their cultures are suppressed and relegated to the private realm that is they are not allowed to practice their culture openly the saudi arabia might be a heterogeneous society but not a culturally plural one indian cultural pluralism <coughs> food is culture in multiculturalist society there is no dominant culture it is the peaceful coexistence of various small cultures india has always been proud of its cultural culturally culturally plural society india has a dominant north indian hindu hindi speaking culture south indian multi language culture however cultures from the south and northeast india like the cuisines idli vada uttapam dance forms bharatanatyam kathakali bihu literature sangam literature are not only respected in the rest of the country but gets an equal space in the cultural display on republic day religious pluralism Religious pluralism is a form of the prevalence of mosques, gurudwara, Buddhist, Jain and Parsi temples and their open religious celebration often joined in by other Hindu friends is a testament of India's religious pluralism. Pluralism cannot be forced by the government through laws. It gets incorporated in societies as they learn to accommodate and respect new cultures. India's long historical tradition of welcoming cultures that land at its shores allows for the presence of today's culturally plural society the difference between india's and america's cultural pluralism is evident america calls itself the melting pot of cultures where all cultures melt to form a common american identity cultures are secondary to the preeminence of national identity however india does not force on one unitary idea of an indian identity because there is no one definition of what it means to be an indian because of its respect for cultures india allows citizens to openly practice their culture come up with their own definition of india pride and hope it is not a negative idea of cultural pluralism which relegates culture to the private realm so one person's culture does not interfere with another person's culture and multiple cultures can coexist peacefully india has a positive idea of cultural pluralism where it allows for full expression of culture in the public realm and instead fosters an idea of respect for different cultures 
it is this culturally plural india that we take pride in and seek to protect for ages to come that is why we accept all kinds of people in our society i appreciate cities like chennai cochin bangalore calcutta delhi where there is cultural pluralism people accept all kinds of people and there is more peace in such in such cities suppose you are doing research on cultural studies these are the textbooks you can refer to in fact i have taken my notes from many of these textbooks cultural studies text and context prantik banerjee cultural studies a practical introduction michael ryan new cultural studies gary hall and claire berkeley an introduction to cultural studies pramod k nayar what is cultural studies a reader john story culture and power john story again history and cultural theory simon gun there are more textbooks but uh, most of the these textbooks give you the general matter so coming to the close of my talk i pray that uh, we all overcome this covid-19 pandemic situation and then learn to love humanity better not to create hatred not to create diversity in the name of just being culturally different but be united in this diversity in the name of cultural pluralism accept different people's culture whether you like it or not and move forward to see a better india so this is a proud indian signing off jai hind thank you thank you so much ma'am it was really a lively and beautiful session you have enlightened us with your vast knowledge you have beautifully explained the concepts of culture and the various cultures and its clashes in the current scenario you have also clearly expressed the different concepts of culture with appropriate examples thank you so much ma'am